async hooks that it's unable to listen to because by the time the user land code runs and attaches, the core promises have already been created and their events emitted. So there's a PR to do a buffering, but there's a lot of questions on that PR, whether it's gonna be good for performance or if it's the right approach or what the right architecture is to make async hooks work with an asynchronous bootstrap. Um, so yeah, the, the, there are a number of technical issues uh, as well as the consensus issues that we need to consider, continue discussing. We're very close. I mean, it's three failing tests and then a few architectural things, but uh, it will take a bit of work to get there. I'm, I'm having a discussion with James and Mateo on Monday and also trying to chat with other core people about um, working towards that, but it's certainly not a given and I also have very limited time. So I would say we're about technically 50-50 before we consider consensus. Um, Salah? Um, yeah, so, so definitely uh, A-string boot, uh, async bootstrapping is, um, you know, like um, it's a, quite a move. And um, so, so I think two questions are important. A, um, how uh, critical, like what are the critical aspects of the, the um, you know, implementation of modules um, that required uh, uh, going async in the bootstrap? You know, I can you know if we say we don't have async bootstrapping, um, what would break? And um, the other thing is, um, I guess, is there other places than module work where async bootstrapping had been something they would want to reach? Um, so I'm just trying to to uh, understand you know how important going async and bootstrapping is or what, what caused it to be of um, such importance uh, if, if there are other important uh, applications for it being async other than just modules. Thanks. Right, in, in theory, there should be other benefits to Node.js core being async. Just traditionally, Node.js core bootstrap has always been synchronous. CommonJS runs synchronously if there's an error it's all in a, in a synchronous execution uh, before bailing out at the top level. Uh, so making it asynchronous, this modules is the first time that there's been a driving need to make node core asynchronous. In theory, modules could be done synchronously, but I think um, especially with top level await and things like that, the whole, the whole pipeline is an asynchronous pipeline. I, I don't think it's a solution to try and de-asyncify it. Um, although maybe there's things we can do around the code. Um, and Wesley, I mean, you were looking into that sort of stuff with the event loops. I mean, if you have any ideas how we can, for example, ensure that the, the promise resolve queue isn't early cleared and, and that error handlers that, that come out in a catch statement don't shift their stack. I mean, that those are like one, two of the, the basic issues, which in theory probably have simple fixes, but it's just getting the, getting the sweat on, on those problems. Um, Salah, so you, did you still have another point? Um, no, I think that that's definitely a good, um, good summary. Thanks. Right. Right, so Wes, Wesley's just saying that you could spin the event loop um, without activating the microtask queue uh, it's maybe those kinds of tricks that we maybe need to investigate to fix that one failure. If anyone is interested or has people that they're able to get on this PR in, in their organizations, that would be a huge help because I personally can't put more full-time days into this myself. Jan? I think part of the issue is that we are using promises in the guts of the modules implementation. So if we don't run the microtask queue, we don't necessarily dispatch the promised stuff that we actually need to dispatch to prepare. Right, but the, so there's kind of a phase, we have the point of synchronous execution. Execution is still synchronous when you reach that point. Um, but we just need to make sure that the task queue is exactly running and Node has this custom task queue as well that maybe needs a bit of manipulation so that it, it exactly gets the same timing. The, the problem is actually like, 
promises created in user code are being flushed slightly earlier than they should have relative to other set immediate callbacks. Is, and then that's in the test case. I can point to the exact, it's like one test, um, but it, it captures that task queue issue. Um, so yeah, as I say, if anyone knows anyone who is able to uh, clone that PR and, and have a look at this timing stuff or this, this error stack stuff, uh, I'm more than happy to advise. Um, but yeah, if, if we can't get that, let alone the ASYN cook stuff, then unfortunately it's not looking good to unflag this month, um, in which case I think we're probably looking at node 13 at the, at the rate of current development. Um, I asked uh, Miles about that, and technically we don't need to necessarily get that merged in this month in order to uh, unflag an LTA in 12, but there's also not that much precedent for um, unflagging in like a uh, major feature line after it's been declared LTS. So, so there might be some wiggle room, but it's kind of up to the, the whims of the core folks, I guess, whoever makes that decision. Right. Shall we move on with the agenda? Um, there, there was one other thing about that um, PR was that uh, one of the items you mentioned that it was obviously it's blocked on these failing tests. It's also blocked on consensus in the group. So, I mean, do we have consensus in the group that if, you know, assuming we get all those tests fixed, that that PR can land? Are you asking? <laughs> I mean, why not, right? If we don't, we should know. <laughs> uh, Salah, do you still have your hand up from before and Yan? I have mine up in response to uh, Joffrey. Sure. Um, yeah, so I don't think we have consensus. I think I agree with Jordan if I'm if I read between the lines what he said earlier that moving things between stages is fine, but using that as a implicit consensus that, oh yeah, once the tests are fixed, we definitely know that the version of modules as it is currently in core can land in between meetings without further discussion. Um, I think we should make a very conscious decision of saying, yes, we believe that the implementation of modules as it is right now can be unflagged. Um, and yes, right now, we just don't know if it actually works uh, as this guy has outlined because there's still stuff that is just broken where we don't know if we can fix it or if it will cause regressions. Um, okay, I mean, that's fair. Now, is that saying like, you know, the current PR, once it gets the tests passing, um, like you want to take another look and see like any changes as a result of getting those tests to pass. You want like a, to be able to take a look at another pass and see like, well, if any of those changes were meaningful and therefore like, oh, maybe we should really like consider this a little bit more or like, cause I, I think there's a difference between that and saying like, oh, we can't unflag until feature X is built, like loaders are built or something like that, where it's like, okay, we know we're not going to be ready you know, in the next two weeks. So therefore it's like, that's the understanding we're, you know, working under, you know what I mean? Is it, is it one or the other of those or is it something else? I have my hand up, but so does uh, Salah. I don't want to cut, line, cut the line. Salah, do you have something else to say or can I respond to Joffrey? Jeffrey, sorry. That was all. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it's lowered now. Sorry. Okay, cool. Um, so then, yeah, I think the, for, for, for me at least, I don't think that loaders are necessarily, are something that we need to wait to unflag. I feel like um, that's the sort of thing that can be added later. I think that um, top level loaders is one thing. And I think that per package loaders is a whole totally different concept. And I think that per package loaders is something that uh, it's not even clear if everyone wants and um, like, so that would have to come later. So, so like for me, the loaders isn't a, isn't the, the hang up. Uh, for me, the thing that continues to be the hang up, um, like 
despite my opinions on things like uh, resolution and extensions and stuff like that, like um, it's really the use cases that I've been concerned about and I've repeatedly said, which is that um, there's two kinds of, of compatibility I want. I want to be able to have a package that works in pre-module node and post-module node, both. Um, it, I had a conversation with Miles last week that convinced me that as long as exports ships at the same time as ESM, they both are unflagged at the same time, then that's actually achievable because you can use the export dot and the main thing to kind of implicitly get uh, a module, no module pivot, right? And so fair, that works. Um, but then the other kind of compatibility I think is important is that um, I want to be able to have, like to make doing that, which is transparently switching between the ESM or the CJS implementation, depending on which version of Node you're in, right? So that's possible there, cool. Uh, what I wanna be able to do is make it so that my package can be required or imported with the same identifier uh, or the same specifier um, in post module node. And I, I realize that we don't have a clear story for that. And there's a couple suggestions of the direction to go there, but I think the use case is what's really important. And I, I really like, I, I mean, I'll have opinions obviously, cause I often do, but like those aren't important as long as the use case can be met. And so I'm open to suggestions. And like, I think it's, it's unfortunate that I don't have the skill set or the time to make PRs and write code to, to explore solutions. But I also think that this is something that, and the, the use cases are important enough that uh, I hope they're not held up by um, whoever has the privilege of having the time and ability to implement things. Um, you know, just not being able to implement the, the use cases I'm interested in. Um, so that's kind of my, like, like I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't think anyone wants to have the perception of being a blocker, of like being the lone voice you know, disrupting its progress and like, but I think that um, I hope that we all consider the the effect it will have. Like, either it's like if we if we unflag now, what I suspect will happen is that um, many packages will not know that it's a send for major change to use ESM. Um, that will cause a lot of ecosystem churn. The ones that know will be a breaking change, which will still cause ecosystem churn and will prevent new bug fixes and security fixes and new features from landing in things that support old versions of Node, including versions of Node that are still under LTS. Um, and, or, and another alternative is that people won't switch to ESM. And I think that's just as much of a tragedy. So like, I'm, I, I, I'm not sitting here with a like, here's a pull request like to look at, but I, I think that it's really important that we come up with a, a solution for those use cases. And, um, I think it would be a huge loss if we unflagged without that. Uh, Jan, have you still got your hand up or is that a, um, from before? Otherwise, Jeffrey, do you want to go? Uh, I let Jeffrey go first. I can write, but I have a follow up for that. Uh, you can, you can go first if you had your hand up first. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the quick note I'll have is, um, I think we have a, fundamental decision point between if the same specifier can be required and imported, is it okay if that will then get the common JS implementation? Um, or do we care more about singletons and the fact that it is generally safer in terms of implementation choices of the package itself? Um, if it, uh, and we, uh, well, no, opposite. We don't care as much about that. And we can allow that it gets the ESM or the common JS implementation, depending on the import side. Um, I think- Totally agree. That yeah. That's a very important decision point. Uh, I, th I think we wanted to make that decision in the past um, by saying that resolution should be always um, what is the word? Uh, <laughs> unambiguous. So if you have a specifier in a file, it should always reserve. Deterministic. Yeah. Deterministic. That was the word I was longing for. Thanks. Um, if, if we stay with that, it's kind of a decision made for us, which is 
if it works with both, then you get the require implementation because without require ESM, that's just the only solution. Would that be something that you would be comfortable with if we are documenting it? Yeah, so I mean, absolutely. I think that the hazard that we're talking about is already rampant in the NPM ecosystem. The solution is peer dependencies, and this certainly adds an inter-package angle facet to that hazard. But I think that if you're making something stateful, you have a but like a whole pile of, of, of foot guns that you have to be aware of already. And if you're aware of them, then this new hazard isn't a problem. And if you're not aware of them, you're going to get bitten eventually anyway. Um, even if like you know, even if this is adding, this is making it surface sooner. It's still like, I, I see that the, that the the bugs people run into because of this, I see as a correct earlier indication that you've architected incorrectly and that you need to fix it or you're going to run into problems later. So I'm completely comfortable with just us deciding that hazard's okay, let's document it well and focus on education. And I think it's much more valuable to allow for the use cases that it does allow, um, which is the majority of the ecosystem that is not stateful would then be able to be maximally backwards compatible, which means maximal ESM adoption across the ecosystem. Jeffrey. Hey, I'm gonna have to go soon. <laughs> but I was gonna say the we've had this debate for almost a year now, and it's on the, the document um, for uh, like, this specific thing of, of having the bare specifier point to two different things. And um, I think what we've determined is that there are going to be people that are just never going to be okay with just accepting the hazards hazard is okay. And like the users will deal with it. Like miles is firmly opposed to that. And that's, I mean, if that's going to be, that's just a blocker for many people. And so that if, if if that, that becomes like an irreconcilable difference between you saying we have to allow it and them saying that's too dangerous. Like, I think the solution that can find consensus is require VSM, as we've discussed. That's not gonna happen before LTS of 12, clearly. Um, so, you know, and if we allow this hazard that might, I feel like might prevent require VSM, but I don't know, someone could correct me on that. Um, I, I think those other issues you discussed, Jordan, of like, uh, you know, it would be a shame if we release this and people can't do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that it, it's a shame to release it without loaders too. I mean, all these other things, like I would like to release it with require VSM or a solution for what you're describing, et cetera. But I also feel like there is a real cost in like just kicking this down the road for another year, year and a half or whatever node 14 goes LTS. And I think that that consequence is like JDD is ESM becoming even more than the de facto standard it already is. And more people not using ESM syntax in Node and more fragmentation and more build tools. And I don't think that's at all good either. Like being able to use the same bare specifier in two module systems feels relatively minor to me. And that could be something we ship as, a, as an improvement like in a later minor release of 12, you know, or require VSM, we can certainly ship in 14. And yeah. if I had to choose between these two outcomes, I mean, that's, that's where I would land. I agree, it's not ideal, but we don't have the option of getting ideal, you know? I mean, I wonder if there's like, there's something we could do with, like currently exports is just like an import map, kind of. It's like a mapping of left-hand side specifiers to which file does that mean? Uh, and there's like some scopes and stuff, I think, but like the, uh, I have to refresh my memory on it, but the, I'm wondering if, if there's a way we could with lower and effort, uh, come up with a solution that says where, where like by default having, uh, this, you know, the same specifier can't, I don't know, so something where like you can't require ESM right now it throws, but there's something we could do in the exports map that would allow require of that ESM file to do something like you could, where you could explicitly opt into saying, yeah, it's cool. This is not stateful. Or you could say, this is stateful. So go to this shared stateful thing, or, you know, I don't know. Um, like something like that. Like I'm, it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be the default as long as there's a path to it. And 
the the package JSON data is easy enough to automate that like I feel like that's a that might be a viable path forward. This is just something off the top of my head. I don't know how. Yeah, I mean, is, there's like, a there one of the other the the only other like or I guess it's not quite the same solution, but there's a there's a proposal that I made for the issue about not having named exports out of CommonJS, which was, I was just like, well, we can't get any other effing solution to work, like <laughs> dynamic modules and whatever, you know, all the various things that people have tried. So I was like, just spent, just define them in damn package.json. Like, it, uh, yeah, everyone mm -hmm. thinks it sucks, but is it really, would you rather just not have it at all versus that? Yeah, I mean, that that is our escape hatch. Like every, you know, mm -hmm. put it in package.json and, you know, theoretically, all these problems can be solved. So, if you want to make well, but a I mean, proposal, what sure. I like about that is that it, it there's a difference between shipping now with a feature, a use case being impossible, and saying we're going to open up that use case later, and shipping now with a use case being annoying but possible, and then saying we're going to make it less annoying later. Like I, I feel like the latter approach is far better for the ecosystem, um, because people will just make tools to automate the annoying part. And then when we fix that, then great, they can drop those tools. But like the- I, th I think a, the thing that know. we have now is already in the realm of annoying. Like it means that you're gonna have like package slash module and then like require package and import package slash module or the reverse. And I, th I would expect people are gonna keep using the module field and it's gonna point to slash module. And then they're gonna have tools that do exactly like you're saying that like will subsume that annoyance and make it invisible to the user. And this won't feel like to, once a user is using a tool like that through whatever tool does that, Babel or Webpack or whatever, gonna this isn't going to feel big to them at all. Quite off topic here. Uh, this okay. was originally the first item on the agenda. We still have quite Sorry. a few to get through that do have resolutions that we can make tangibly. Um, so if you just want to finish your points, I think I think I'm done. Uh, so we'll wait. I I think the consensus I'm hearing is we'll wait for the PR, the unflagging PR, to actually be ready to be merged in, like it passes all the tests, and then we'll rediscuss this at the next meeting. Is that, we have we all agree on that? And then the yeah, exports, the same thing. Um, I guess uh, Jordan, please look at that PR. Uh, anyone else, please look at the PR about the roadmap. Um, I think it correlates with what I just described about waiting for the two unflagging PRs. If you want me to change the wording of like after unflagging to something else, by all means, suggest something and we can make changes and just land it. But I think it reflects essentially where we, where we are. Thanks, Kai. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, the The next item we had was the JSON modules on the web. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into this one since we're already running out of time. Um, but uh, because uh, JSON modules have actually been removed from HTML, we are now, uh, and they're based on a security argument, and there are potentially other types of syntax that are being proposed for importing JSON. So the concern is that if we, if we ship JSON and then the web does import JSON as JSON or something like that, that's kind of a semantical, semantic import, uh, then we might be in a situation where we've you know, created a, a compatibility issue. So the, the suggestion was to reflag in Node. Uh, if anyone has any strong objections to that or, or any opinions on that, either way, please do show your opinions. As I say, I prefer not to get too too deep into this one now, if possible. Uh, ideally, if we can move on fairly quickly. Jan? So, click the wrong button, but meant to raise my hand. Um, I, I think unflagging right now is relatively cheap. Flagging right now is relatively cheap. So I think we can relatively safely err on the side of safety and just bring the flag back. Um, and then we can hopefully still unflag as soon as the dust has settled. Okay. 
Uh, if, if no one else has anything to add, uh, I'll move on to the next item, uh, which is uh, script-based configuration files in type module packages. And maybe this also touches on the conversation we're having just now, uh, where we had a whole bunch of uh, issues that were posted when we shipped this, this hazard protection, which was effectively throwing when you load a JS file from CommonJS inside a type module package. And uh, when that went out, we had a, a bug report by Fedor uh, that like ESLint.js wasn't working in their type module package. And it's worth bearing in mind that since we've been documenting type module, when we first came up with type module, there was like no one using it. Now people are shipping it and using it already. So like we already have compatibility <laughs> concerns out of our own um, documentation efforts, unfortunately. Maybe we should have just kept quiet, but anyway. Uh, so we're now in this sort of interim period where people are uh, already starting to use it. And then uh, we ship behaviors that, that break things. And the, the example is you've got your bab Babel configs, you've got all these other things. And most of those configuration systems load their config with a, a require statement or something internally, and now all your tools break. So upgrading to modules isn't, you add a field to your package JSON, and now suddenly all your, all your tooling breaks. I mean, of course not TypeScript because it uses JSON, but Everything else breaks. Uh, so that's one example, and there might be other ways that this, this thing bites. Uh, so for now, we've disabled it, but we do have to consider what we want to do. Uh, I did post one PR up to node core. I'll just get the link very quickly, uh, which was basically taking in the opposite direction to say, you know what, do we have to restrict common JS as much? Maybe we can just let the common JS require, still require things. Um, and even, even when it is the hazard, um, but because of the fact that the only modules that will that will hit the case where you've got two different instances are modules that use neither require syntax nor export syntax. Uh, so that the hazard might be a small enough subset for you know, that union uh, of, of that, um, which it might be a small enough subset that we could allow it. And that also kind of ties into Jordan's point just now where you were saying, well, could we just let require work, um, this kind of does that. Um, it just allows require to work out um, for common JS. So we don't try to change common JS. We say, well, it can still eat the world. If it wants to require a .exe file, it can. If it wants to require a JS file and a type module, it can. Um, but what we're controlling mm -hmm. is the ES module semantics and the ES module loader. I know Wesley has very strong opinions on this topic as well. So may maybe Wesley, if, if you would like to share your thoughts on, on this stuff. I mean, like my thoughts are just simply that like the so like the problem was never like the from the resolver standpoint, the problem was never really from the ESM side because the ESM side is already so heavily limited where it can only like import things that are exact paths anyway. Like it was always the behavior of the common JS resolver. And so like walking it back and saying the common JS resolver can require dot JS is, is undoing pretty much everything that we talked about when we were discussing the type module field other than like the change in ESM of like throwing or not. Like the reason the type module field exists at all is to prevent this problem from happening so the CJS loader can throw. Otherwise you have no need to use the type module field because you can just say well the CJS loader loads things to CJS and the ESM loader loads things to ESM. Shrug. Uh, well, specifically, the problem was how does the ESM loader load common JS? How does it know when to switch into the common JS? And like that, like the, uh, like, uh, like it provides such a problem for tools because then you don't know whether a file is going to be interpreted as ESM or CJS by another importing file. Uh, like, we use heuristics today because Node doesn't have a field that strongly indicates it. And Node doesn't want to use heuristics, which is why we added the field. But now we're weakening the field such that you still have to use heuristics. It's so bad. <laughs> can, can I just respond directly to that? <laughs> uh, sure, Salah had his hand up first. Um, so Salah, is your, is your point related to this? Yeah. Um, 
I'm basically uh, thinking along the lines of uh, create a legacy require function or require.legacy. Um, if people want to use require with resolution that is separate from ESM and you don't want to create this as a contentious alternative runtime uh, flag or setting, we can just make a require function that works um, but is discouraged uh, and not, not meant to be used uh, as an alternative to the normal require. It's just used by tools. Oh, that's that's actually not a problem. They can already do that. Um, and, and in fact, there was like a patch put up for ESLint that just, you know, read the file and then fresh evaled it anyway, because they don't actually use real require. They use fresh, fresh import package to get a new copy every time. Uh, yeah, that, that was my PR. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the point isn't like it, it can already be done. It can already be worked around with new code. The only concern is, well, existing code, people already started adopting type module before we shipped it. And so like existing code that air quotes works is already using an experimental flag and is breaking. The thing is it's an experimental flag in people's package JSON. When you started using it, you opted into being broken because we haven't shipped the finished feature yet. Jeffrey, go for it. Uh, yeah, but the person who opted into it is the user. The person feeling like things broke is the tool author. So I can understand why the tool authors are upset. They feel like Node shipped a broken chain that they didn't opt into. So I understand where they're coming from. It is, uh, that, is, that is a much smaller set of people, though. Like, that is the, right. and the I, better and I, people to break by far. Right. And it, there's not that many of them. They can look at the ESM PR and do the same thing. It's not that big a deal, you know? As far as your point that I wanted to respond to about like, how does a tool know how to interpret a file? That, I don't think that really exists yet, like right now in Node until we, until we add ESM. Like they, they all, they, they know that all JS files are common JS JavaScript files, you know what I mean? No, so this actually, idea of, actually, that's actually not true at all. The, see, the issue here is if I see today, before Node ships modules, a JS file in a package, I heuristically guess whether it's a common JS file or uh, an ESM file that needs to be transpiled. And I do that by looking at syntax. And people have come to the conclusion over the last three years that that's a terrible solution and no one wants to encode that solution as a standard. So we're trying to look beyond that and find a different answer here. And that's why we have type module and extension based module format detection. Uh, and so the ideal there is we say, all right, well, that, that means .js in, in a node package means that it is just a common JS file, and it will always be a common JS file unless there is something indicating otherwise. And that something indicating otherwise would either be a different extension, the .mjs extension, and that's why that exists, or the type module field, which changes the interpretation of those extensions. This way we don't need to look at syntax at all. Now, when you make it so require can just require arbitrary files as ESM, that means that these formats are no longer strong. They mean that I can have this file that might be loaded as common as ESM or as common JS. And yes, I could theoretically load an arbitrary string as common JS or ESM, but the entire thing that matters is the intent. Like, do I know whether when the user wrote the file, did they want it to be loaded as common JS or did they want it to be loaded as ESM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. I get it. So in this thread, I proposed some new utility method like resolve type that just says with this path, is Node going to treat this as common JS or module? And then based on that, they can decide what they want to do. They can use that dynamic has, import. They can has, do the hack of has no historically they already exist. That already exists. It's called path.x name. Yeah, and can, more, can I just so, say we're we're already running out of time on this issue again? There's also people who have their hands up. And more importantly, that doesn't change anything to do with the current like adding type module and its common JS resolver behavior like breaks people who are already using type module like that still requires people to write new code to change things which is exactly what we're talking about avoiding and like i'm simply here trying to make the argument that if you opted into type module and we break you that's fine because you opted into type module yes i so, i so, so, yeah, you yeah. had your hand up for a while uh, jeffrey do you mind if i let jan speak because we've only got a couple of minutes on this topic all right so the thing i wanted to say is i think Wes is preaching to the choir. I don't think that people really believe that being able to opt out of 
type module for common JS files is a thing that ex should exist or should exist longer term. Um, it is more a, how do we deal with the intermediate term fallout of actually enforcing it? Um, and I think multiple people have made a very good case that maybe the shock of this first breakage was enough for tool authors to support .cjs for their files. Because as soon as tools support .cjs, we are good. Uh, people can just use eslintrc.cjs and everything's fine. Uh, and people who are using type module already should be on the edge enough that they are able to update to the latest version of eslint. Um, and I think if we have that in place, there really isn't much of a reason to not try again to either bring back the exception or at least log a very big deprecation message or whatever it is. Um, and then longer term, yes, type module will mean that all JS files are ESM and they will never be accepted by the CJS loader. Yes, it's just that you need to actually roll it out. Uh, who else has their hands up? Uh, Salah, you've had your hand up for a while. Jeffrey. Sorry. Okay, Wes. I can get behind shipping a deprecation warning if we don't ship type module yet at all, because then we still have a world where there is type module and we have support for that. And that is entirely like it does its thing entirely. Because if we ship the deprecation now, even if we ship the deprecation before we ship modules, right? We like add the type module support and we add the deprecation warning because we know we're going to have type module in the future. That's fine because then we haven't actually shipped type module yet. We haven't shipped modules yet even. And we are now emitting deprecation warnings because we know what people are doing will error in the future and we're warning them about that. That's fine to me. However, shipping a version of type module, and it is a different version of it, that emits a deprecation warning rather than the hard error, is an environment that is like a different and third environment. Like it's different than CJS today and it's different than type module with a hard error. And like tools will have to support that environment as well. It's creating a third situation that needs to be supported. And it's, it's worse that way. And right, so like, may, I, yeah, may I try and suggest where a resolution then for now, given the limited time we have, uh, what if we try the shipping um, the deprecation again, separate like now, like we did before, but as, as a deprecation warning with suitable context and information to use it. So it's not just um, like, like it was before, error require as in, and, and it wasn't very clear. Um, we allow it to work, but we ship with a, a deprecation uh, already now in, in Node 12. Yeah, but how does that change when we unflag, right? So, so that defers the question of whether unflagging should throw or, or, or warn, um, but it at least tries to build some, some consensus around that. It's like, I, I definitely think we can add the deprecation warning now, but I, I don't think I would want to unflag with only a deprecation warning in place because that's it, that's hell for tools because that's another two years of purgatory in terms of tooling support that we need to go through. I'll take that as consensus. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as the maintainer of Resolve, like I do not want to have to maintain ideally more than two sets of features here. <laughs> Currently have all of CJS and I'd love to just have one release that adds ESM and not have to keep doing iterations. Okay, let's move on where we used to have time. I'm gonna um, skip over loader hooks on the agenda if you don't mind, unless anyone has anything important to add on that. Uh, which brings us to Jan's pre PR uh, to load uh, package relative specifiers. Uh, he's had the PR up for a while. I believe there's still some debate over the symbol. Devin Govett from Parcel was saying that he quite likes the tilde uh, and uh, uh, 
at the moment the PR uses the at symbol. So it seems like the consensus issue is actually just over the symbol at this point. Um, and whatever we like, even if Devin suggested the tilde, whatever consensus we have is obviously the consensus we move forward. So we just need to make sure that we ourselves agree. Um, sorry, Alex just added there that loader has the, the he provided the PR to rename loader to experimental loader um, for note uh, on, on the loader topic. Um, but on the package relative topic, who wants to kick off discussion further? Jan? Uh, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the primary debate was we originally went with tilde because that's what literally everything in the ecosystem that wants this use case does. But then there was an objection from um, not even just, I think Gus was original one, but like, I think at least one other person echoed it, that because of the conceptual overlap with the user's home directory in like a POSIX shell, um, that they didn't want tilde to go through and we kind of settled on at and like, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little confused why we don't just go ahead and do that. Um, like mainly because like, if those are the two choices and no one has a hard objection to one of them, <laughs> then that's the one we should pick. <laughs> and, uh, as much as I'd prefer tilde, because that's what everyone uses, like, that's fine. Like I want the feature, let's just ship it. So is there any, so we do actually have a uh, quorum right now. So if everyone agrees, okay. we can ship the app, we can go ahead and do that. Yeah, uh, unless Gus has changed uh, his mind about the objection. <laughs> the, there was a hard objection to add from one of the core members on that PR. Uh, who was that's, why, that's why the TSC got pulled in. I mean, which I one? guess that uh, I look on the PR. There yeah. was at, at least one, I want to say, M. Kalina, I want to say. Yeah. I forget who it was. Okay. okay. Uh, does but, anyone know uh, if there was a flip, resolution? The flip right side, though, is that there are no objections other than Gus, I don't think, to Tilde. So if Gus is willing to let Tilde go, then, then presumably this could be over. Right. Well, it, it sounds like though, it, like if we can maybe right now agree that tilde or at is okay, as long as node collaborators, which includes Gus and Mateo can agree, um, then that's modules group consensus. And then if we could recommend strongly that the TSC just vote and pick one, um, and, and you know, then great, that should be the plan. And then Gus and Mateo and whoever else can battle that out in the TSC meeting where we don't have to be involved. <laughs> we'll, we'll make a note of that and uh, drive this. I think we have consensus on that, right? <laughs> Good. Cool. And Gus, I assume you're cool with that as an outcome, like the TSC can, you know, one of you can cave or TSC can override and that's that. So cool. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, which brings us to the last agenda item, which is I uh, posted a, a PR to unflag experimental exports. Uh, when we originally shipped exports, uh, it's shipped behind experimental modules and behind its own experimental exports flag, uh, leading up to what, you know requirements to think about unflagging modules. I think it is important that exports goes along with it. So to me, this was like one of the prerequisite PRs to the unflagging modules PR. We don't need to um, land it now, but I like at some point we need to vote and get through because I can't get, we can't get an unflagging PR and so we've got that. Um, we don't want the unflagging PR to land and then separately do the exports unflagging and then we've got a potential gap. So um, I just wanted to find out if there's any, um, you know, what the objections are to removing that flag or where exports should be before we consider that it can just be a, a base level feature of experimental modules. Um, Jan? Um, I think the short answer for me is in the past, I preferred having exports only land after self-references land. I think that it's fine to land it as is, given that self-references seem like something that will follow relatively shortly after because there doesn't seem to be any fundamental objections to it. Sila? All right, lowered my hand first. Now I'm gonna talk. Uh, sorry, um, um, uh, just a quick question because I'm not caught up on the details. Um, at some point we'll wonder about dual mode uh, in the future when, when people have uh, both, they might actually want that feature more than ever. So, so just if we do unflag exports, um, 
I, I'm pretty sure there's a lot more thinking to it. Um, exports when a package is not just one mode. Um, is, is that something that, um, that can become a problem? Uh, is that something that could change a lot? Um, um, or is the current um, you know, strategy for it flexible enough for dual mode to be just works as expected? So right now, exports are entirely independent from the mode of the package or the interpretation of the package. So exports is, like to use that overused term, completely orthogonal. Um, uh, you can use exports to do a dual mode if you if you are, for example, loading CJS files or um, at, in a type module boundary. You can get exports, different exports pointing to different module formats. Um, an ability to like fork exports hasn't been proposed yet or or looked at. Um, yeah. yeah. S sorry, Salai, were you going to respond on that? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, a, a point about exports in dual mode comes from the notion that you would have one specifier pointing to separate types. Um, and those, those being, uh, so, so, so that bit would just be smooth sailing. People right. will be upgrading their export maps. So it's it's con conditional exports maps, um, which we don't have any proposals for. Okay. All right. Uh, I mean, if... if I would amend Guy's answer with, we don't have a specific implementation for conditional exports, but we do have the wiring with the arrays right now that we could introduce conditionals inside of exports. So we could implement something where it says, if one of the array elements is formatted in a specific way, then we would use that only for common JS. It's not planned right now, but we do have the design space to do such working. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly the point. So it's an enhancement. It's not going back and changing something that we'll worry about versions out in the wild, basically. So, all right, thanks. So we've got a, well, a couple of minutes since we started a few minutes late. Uh, Jordan? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, so I think um, I would be very ecstatic if exports could get the unflag and go out immediately. That said, um, based on my conversation with Miles last week, that's the only way I know of to do pre-module and post-module node dual duality. So if that if exports gets unflagged first, even though it should have no correlation, um, I would be then very concerned that there is no way to do that when modules unflags in a different node version. Com completely that's agree. That. And and to clarify, when I say exports is unflagged, I mean it's still under experimental modules, even for the export implementation in common JS. Oh yeah, I'm fine with it being the unflagged flag, yeah. with, within the experimental flag. I just don't want it to be at all unflagged at all, you know, there. So could I just ask a question? So we're just discussing removing the experimental exports flag, which still wouldn't release the feature because then it's, it's waiting on models overall to be unflagged to then kind of release it along with the overall ESM. Is that correct? Right. I mean, look, another way we could spin this is to actually merge the experimental exports and flagging with the experimental modules and flagging so that they just become one PR. Um, I was trying to avoid that so that we could vote on them separately, but if, if we're happy to do them all together, I can just merge them and it's a non-issue. I mean, it sounds like we don't have any objections to exports. So, although there might be people who don't want it to be released until modules is released. So I feel like we might as well merge in or you could ask, does anyone object to exports and assuming there's not, then we just merge them together. Sure. Uh, so yeah, Jan, do you want to add one more point before we check the vote on that? Um, sounds good to me to just say there's no experimental exports flag. It's just part of experimental modules. Okay, so does anyone object to uh, remove, uh, posting PR to remove the experimental exports flag, but still leave it the behaviors behind experimental modules? So I, I just like I, I do not object. I think we should do that, um, but I want to make sure that uh, that we have some sort of explicitly noted caveat that if we come up with a way to do pre-node post-node duality that does not require exports, at that point I would immediately prefer to see exports unflagged in CJS. <laughs> 
Like that's like, to me, that is the only thing holding back exports just being sent out to the community right now. And if, if everyone agrees with that, and we may never come up with that caveat, but like that would be, if that obstacle's removed, then like, let's get it out there. Is well, I think that, that could just be its own PR. If someone posts a PR that yeah. achieves that, then we could just vote on it and release it. Cool. Okay. Great, we've hit time. Uh, so we can note that resolution and we can get that merged. And uh, yeah, thank you so much everyone for listening to each other and uh, hopefully we can continue to make progress. Also, if anyone has any headcount to put on this unflagging PR, please let me know. It's, it's quite a urgent thing. Thanks. Thanks for all your work on it. Yes, thank you, Guy. And uh, I'm assuming we're gonna merge that roadmap PR unless anyone has any objection the next day or so. So Jordan, if you could please take a look at it. Um, yeah, I'll take a look. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye. Later. Bye.